Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming to, well, to my uh, first uh, tutorial series of today's, uh, of today's um, program for the Ellis Summer School here in Cambridge. Thank you all for waking up so early to come listen to me ramble about graph nets. I hope you will. I hope I will justify the confidence you've given to me. Uh, as you might see, we're experiencing some technical issues with uh, one of the projectors, which uh, as someone who has been part of this department in one way or another for 10 years, I can tell you this happens all the time. So like uh, this should fix itself at some point soon. Uh, if it doesn't and you're sitting to that side and you'd like to move a little bit closer, please feel free to, but hopefully it should all be fine. Uh, so I've been told I should introduce myself. So my name is Petar Velichkovic. I am currently a staff research scientist at DeepMind and an affiliated lecturer here at the computer lab. And uh, I generally work on uh, uh, topics involving geometric deep learning, which broadly can be summarized as pick up the interesting things about the geometry of data and then build machine learning models that capture that geometry. One very special, and in my opinion, the most general case of this uh, idea is machine learning over graphs, which is my main area of research and what I'll try to tell you more about during the sessions today. And uh, within this scope of learning representations of graphs, uh, I have uh, a few claims to fame, both in terms of fundamental research and applied research. I won't bore you with the details at the beginning because through these slides, you'll get a chance to see some of the things that uh, these cool models can do. And also which of those things, uh, I'll, I'll be sure to let you know which of those things I've been involved in so that uh, if you have some questions, those will be the projects where I can give you the most information. Uh, I imagine it is a sort of interactive session with a 10 minute break in between. So. If at any point you hear something that doesn't sound right, I encourage you to raise your hand and ask a question rather than we wait until the end of the session to answer the question because some of the things you will hear today, it being a tutorial, depend on the things you heard before, right? So if something isn't clear in the middle, you're not going to understand something that comes later, okay? So hoping we all agree on that, uh, you know, let's get started. I will probably need to, all right, there we go. So let's start with a bit of an introduction. I often like to say when I give talks on graph neural networks that uh, uh, I'm gonna come here to talk to you about graph representation learning. And I hope uh, you will come away from this session being convinced that in principle, everyone should be doing graph representation learning, which is you know a big ask potentially, but let's see if there's any actual meat behind this claim that I'm making. Why should we study data that lives on graphs? Well, the first reason I like to give, especially to people who are a bit uninitiated or might be more used to machine learning over more casually structured data like grids or images, is that uh, when you really, really think about it, graphs are pretty much all around us, right? You can find them at basically all levels of organization in living beings, starting from the molecule, which is the main building block of life, and it can be very naturally represented as an interconnected structure of atoms connected together by chemical bonds, all the way up to uh, fascinating organic structures like the connectomic structure of neurons in the human brain, which is also most naturally represented as an interconnected structure, right, of neurons connected together by dendritic connections. And this, uh, this very convenient network here represents the foundation behind all of our cognitive processes. So it's quite impressive to see graphs be so pervasive from the lowest level all the way to the highest level of organization. And also when you think about not natural constructs, but human constructs, graphs also pop up pretty much everywhere here. For example, transportation networks, which is an example I'll mention in a few slides time also, uh, such as this somewhat outdated picture of the London tube map, very naturally representable as a graph structure where nodes are different stations and edges correspond to different tube lines. Great. And also uh, social networks, very popular example. Here you have a somewhat outdated picture of the Facebook friendship graph. Once again, very naturally represented as a graph, different humans correspond to nodes, friendship links correspond to edges. So basically, it seems like graphs are a very great way and a very accurate way to model the irregular structure of objects all around us, both natural and artificial. So studying data that lives on them is probably going to be a good idea. And I think in the last five, six years, more and more industrial and scientific players are starting to realize this, that in reality, all the data they're working with is very likely graph data under the hood. 
And this has actually led to quite a few breakthroughs in both science and industry that have been powered by graph neural networks. So first of all, they have been responsible for some pretty fantastic scientific discoveries. My favorite is this one. Uh, you might have seen titles like these around February 2020 about scientists discovering powerful antibiotics using AI. This AI in question was a graph neural network applied on the structure of the molecule trying to predict whether or not it would be a good antibiotic. Very, uh, from the point of view of its architecture, it was a very standard graph neural network model. And it was already able to power such a, a great discovery of finding a new antibiotic that previously completely escaped the search space of uh, human uh, uh, computational chemists. <clears throat> but beyond science, as mentioned, all the industrial players that work with big data, especially big interconnected data, are starting to realize what kind of potential these models could have. And as a result, a lot of the things that they serve you nowadays is going to be powered by a graph neural network model. So graph nets are impacting your lives, even if you are not aware of it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, here I've highlighted just one example of Uber Eats, which notably reports using graph neural networks to recommend you which food you should eat next, but it goes beyond Uber Eats. Amazon is using them to tell you which products you should buy next. Pinterest is using it to tell you which items of content you should look at next. Airbnb recently announced they're using them to uh, recommend to you which places you should visit next, right? And the personal example, which as I said, you'll see a few examples of my own claims to fame. Uh, this guy over here, uh, as part of a team at DeepMind, we have deployed graph neural networks inside Google Maps. As I mentioned in the previous slide, you can imagine transportation networks as a very nicely interconnected graph. And we put a graph neural network on top of this graph to predict when you go to Google Maps and you type, I want to travel from A to B, and Google Maps tells you a route and it serves you how much time it should take to travel that route. The model that predicts how much time it will take is a graph neural network that we have deployed. And at the time of deploying it, we have in some cities like Sydney, improved the previous results that Google's baseline was doing by up to 50% relative improvement. So it was quite significant. Just being mindful of the graph topology of the road was quite an impactful thing to do. And uh, it's recently uh, been deployed worldwide. So no matter where in the world you are, if you ask Google Maps for a route from A to B, it's going to be served by this model over here, right? And a very interesting meta point uh, coming from Google AI is basically through the use of graph neural networks and reinforcement learning, trying to place components on a chip to design an AI chip with some kind of functionality more efficiently than a human uh, chip designer would do. And it turns out that this uh, GNN with reinforcement learning can teach itself to design chips better than a human expert in under six hours. And very notably, Google AI has already used this software to develop the latest generation of the TPU chip, which is used for machine learning internally at Google, which I think is a really cool meta point, right? AI powered by graph neural networks is designing chips that will be used to power the next generation of AI. You can imagine there's a bit of a, uh, you know, positive feedback potentially happening here. Okay. So when you think about this, right, it's clear that graphs are all around us. And it's also clear that more and more players are playing with them in very interesting ways. But if you think about it even more deeply, like, you know, if you think about the modalities where uh, neural networks tend to be most popular, like images and text, and we will touch upon both of those quite a bit during this uh, tutorial, you can see that when you really think about it, they are also graph structured, right? They are just structured in a very regular way. In an image, you have a graph of pixels that are connected to their immediate neighbors. In text, you might have a graph of words that are connected to the previous and the next word, for example. That might not be the best way, as we will discuss later, but certainly you can think about them also as graph structured. And convnets and recurrent nets and these kinds of models can then be seen as special cases of graph neural networks over those graphs, okay? So in many ways, you can think about graphs as the main modality of data that we receive from nature. And there's another great point there, like with images, these are two dimensional snapshots of something, right? But very likely, you know, when you take a picture of me, that's a two dimensional picture. Does that mean I am two dimensional? No, I am a very complicated three dimensional object, or at least I like to think so, right? The, the act of taking a picture of me projects my three dimensional object into a 2D plane so you can more easily process me with a computer, right? 
this ignores a ton of nuances about my shape, about my movement and these kinds of things, right? So in reality, very often when you have a very nice 2D representation like an image, it's usually a human heuristic of something far more complicated and something far more irregularly structured. So always think about it. There's usually a graph underneath your nicely structured data. Okay, and uh, I always like to put this quote from J. Wright Forrester, which also talks about the mental model with which cognition is founded. And if you really think about it, the image of the world that you carry around in your head is quite graph structured, right? You don't like uh, imagine immediately in your head all the possible concepts that could ever be. Rather, you have some selected concepts, you know about relationships between them, and then you use some reasoning to derive new knowledge about the world, right? So in a way, the processes that underlie human cognition are structured as reasoning procedures over some kind of a graph structure that's maintained in your brain, right? And as a result, if we truly want to build artificial general intelligence, like an agent that's able to, in a lifelong manner, interact with the world and construct the knowledge of everything that's encountered so far to derive new knowledge in situations they've never seen before, it is quite unlikely you'll be able to build that without something that feels like graph representation learning, okay? And recently using these principles, you can even actually make quite impactful uh, strides in science. This example of our recent work that was on the cover of Nature a few months ago, we actually used models including graph neural networks to probe the structure of complicated mathematical objects and find the most interesting subparts of mathematical objects that should be studied further. And using these kinds of interventions, uh, top tier mathematicians from Oxford and Sydney have been able to make actionable conjectures and prove new theorems in very diverse areas of math, like knot theory and representation theory. The significance of these results has been recognized by nature since we managed to get published there. And also there was quite a few uh, uh, stints with the popular press. But uh, one thing that I also find quite cool about this is that even though I always knew I wasn't that talented in maths, I was able to now co-write the paper with the top mathematician and we recently got it published in a top tier math journal. So beyond the fact that this was published in Nature, the machine learning oriented paper, within it, you have two top tier math journal papers like containing two separate uh, heavy contributions. So AI can truly provide these kinds of inspirations and the specific model that powers these inspirations is the graph neural network. Okay, so now that I guided you through that necessary introduction, uh, you can ask yourself, why are we here? And I hope I've successfully convinced everyone in this room that graphs are everywhere and that representation learning on graphs in one way or another is here to stay, okay? And also because graphs are so pervasive all around us, no matter what field of machine learning you choose to specialize in, I bet you there's a good chance you will come into contact with graph representation learning. Although as we will discuss during this lecture, sometimes you might be doing graph representation learning without ever realizing you're doing it, okay? So that's, that's also gonna be one interesting thing to discuss, okay? So what do I wanna do with this tutorial? I wanna make graph representation learning easy to navigate, leverage and contribute to. So no matter what you want to do, do you just wanna explore literature, find the latest results? Do you want to actually use those results in some practical or research project? Or do you even want to make fundamental contributions to the field? I want to make it as easy as possible to do those three. And I would appreciate at the end of this tutorial, some feedback on whether or not I achieved that. Okay, and hopefully it's not going to be just a bland introduction to navigation, leveraging and contributing. I hope to also give you some of my interesting anecdotal insights that I acquired along the way. Of course, there's always going to be a bit of a bias on the things I know how to do well, so your mileage may vary. But if you have any specific questions about things I did not cover today, please feel free to ask at any point. Okay, so this is me. I'll be talking to you about all of these things today. And uh, if uh, for any reason after the lecture you want to reach out to me, there's some question that comes to your mind. Uh, this is my email. Feel free to reach out to me here. And this is my Twitter. I'm quite active there. I rant a lot there. So what this tutorial will cover, we will start with a geometric view of graph neural networks, which will tell you in a nutshell how graph representation learning is set up mathematically. And we're going to derive a graph neural network from first principles. So I'm not gonna start by telling you the equation of a graph neural network. I'm gonna start by telling you the principles from which you can derive the equation of a graph neural network yourself, okay? Once we're all on good foundational understanding on where the GNNs come from and what their equations are, 
then we can talk about some more interesting structural questions like latent graph inference and also the weiss phylo lehmann hierarchy, which will, in a nutshell, tell us how powerful graph neural networks are and how can we build more powerful ones. And lastly, I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about the algorithmic view of graph neural networks, centering on uh, our recent work on neural algorithmic reasoning and AI for maths, depending on how much time we have. So this is really a tutorial that could go as short or as long as, as we fit in these two hours uh, plus breaks. But as I said, at any point, please raise your hand and ask questions if you go. Now, one thing which makes graph representation learning so nice of a field to contribute to nowadays is like, as you can tell from all of the slides I showed you before, it's currently experiencing a sort of ImageNet moment. Like people are rapidly starting to understand how useful it can be. They're deploying it everywhere and uh, you know they're rapidly iterating. But compared to the convolution network uh, boom in 2012, when you didn't really have a big choice of libraries and data sets to go on, graph representation learning is now in a much more convenient space. So no matter what your favorite poison is, is it PyTorch, is it TensorFlow, or if you're like myself, is it JAX? Um, there is a top tier graph representation learning library that you can use to power your discoveries. And you know, if you don't want to deal with the internals of these models, you can just take a black box implementation of one of the GNN models and plug it into your project, right? So you have PyTorch Geometric, or as it's recently been rebranded uh, by Stanford as PyG, and the Deep Graph Library for PyTorch. You have uh, Spectral and TensorFlow GNN coming from Google uh, for TensorFlow. And in case you use Jax, like myself, uh, DeepMind has recently put out its own internal implementation of uh, our internal graph neural network library, Giraffe, Jax Graph, right? Uh, conveniently graph structured Giraffe. Um, so yeah. If you want to find any resources, these should be good. And you cannot have good models without good data. And I think people in graph representation learning re realize this more than some other fields. And we know our data sets are never good enough. So we always try to improve them. And there's a lot of very focused uh, efforts to build really strong data sets. Uh, I would particularly highlight the open graph benchmark from Stanford, which tries to give you really good uh, real world motivated large scale graph structure data sets. There's also benchmarking graph neural networks, which is concerned with building the best possible graph neural network under a certain uh, parameter count constraint. So think of it as more of a competitive programming for GNNs. And there's also the classical TU data sets, which cover a wide range of interesting graph classification tasks. And like inevitably some of the slides I'm going to show you are related to if you then go away and start to read some of the seminal papers in the area, you'll find some practices that are no longer best practices. So if you read some of the uh, some of the first GNN papers in the most recent wave of GNNs, starting with GCNs, my own graph retention network, and so on, you'll probably find these three data sets being mentioned quite a bit, Quora, Sightseer, and PubMed. They've been super popular in early papers, and they've been great to spearhead everybody getting into the field because they were so small. They did not even require a GPU. You can train on a CPU on these kinds of models very, very quickly, okay? And, you know, one good exercise post-tutorial to convince yourselves you've understood some of the concepts, it's a very nice quick exercise to go in a collab and implement the graph neural network classifier over the Quora data set. That's a really fun thing to do afterwards if you've never done graph nets before but I would recommend you never to actually use them in academic research nowadays. We have several papers showing why those data sets are not the best way to evaluate graph machine learning models. So unless you're doing some very specific synthetic study, you put this data set in a paper, it's just a red flag for a reviewer to reject you. So please do not do that. Okay, and in case uh, books or uh, lecture series or blog posts are your favorite uh, kind of means of studying about the field further, I'll just mention this whole tutorial is based on the book I'm currently co-writing with Michael Bronstein, John Bruna, and Taco Cohen uh, on geometric deep learning, which talks about learning on graphs, but as I said, also learning over all kinds of funky geometric objects like grids, groups, geodesics, and manifolds. So if you're interested, we put all the resources on geometricdeeplearning.com. You can find the full 150-page protobook there. We are going to publish the full book with MIT Press in 2023, hoping we meet the deadline uh, to write it. Uh, we also have a lot of blog posts talking about the work in an informal way. We have a lot of lectures, like we gave a whole lecture course on this and we made all the recordings and slides available online on this website. So you can probably find a lot of cool resources there. If you want something that focuses uh, on GNN specifically and kind of ignores the other interesting geometries, 
Uh, Will Hamilton also wrote this really nice and accessible book on graph representation learning. It came out a few years ago, so it might not be the most relevant with, for today's trends, but it's still a very nice light introduction into the dynamic world of GNN research. And it's also publicly available on Will Hamilton's website. Okay, now we can finally get started. So uh, let's try to set up some mathematical formulations so we're all on the same page about the notation I'm going to use. We're going to think of graphs as collections of objects, which we sometimes call nodes or vertices, and interactions between them, which we sometimes call edges or links. So formally, a graph is a tuple of two sets, set of nodes and set of edges, which is the set of uh, pairs of nodes, basically. And depending on the context, you may refer to nodes as vertices or edges as links or relations, but we're usually, for, this, for the purpose of this course, we're going to refer to them as the same thing. And there's many ways to represent edges. One way that we will find quite useful, and I'll repeat it several times uh, during this tutorial, is the adjacency matrix A. It's, it's a nice linear algebra way to represent the edges in a nodes by nodes matrix, which is for now just a binary matrix with uh, zeros where there's no edge and ones where there is an edge, okay? <clears throat> and then there's a few very interesting subtypes of graphs that we might encounter either during this tutorial or afterwards. You can have undirected graphs where uh, the uh, adjacency matrix is symmetric. So if I point to you, you also point back to me. This is a fun assumption to make sometimes in social networks, for example. If I'm friends with you, I would usually expect you're friends with me as well, I hope. Um, then graphs can also be weighted where you don't just have a binary flag in the edges, but also you might have some edge weight telling you the distance between different nodes. This can be quite useful in road networks, for example, where weights can specify speeds or distances. You might also have multi-relational graphs. This is very popular in knowledge graphs where two nodes are not just connected by an edge, but that edge has a type. So for example, someone is parent of someone, someone is spouse of someone. You can encode these things with edge types. And finally, heterogeneous graphs are getting quite popular in a biomedical context recently where the nodes can have different types. So if you have like a biomedical knowledge graph, nodes might correspond to either drugs, proteins, or diseases, and then you try to infer new relationships between them to repurpose drugs. Okay, and also the different tasks on a graph you can solve. We will see this in a few instances during the lecture today. But basically, you can have labels on the level of nodes, which allows you to detect, for example, topics of documents based on the citation graph. Here, I've color-coded uh, all of the examples so that you have, like, this thing corresponds to nodes, red is nodes, blue is edges, green is graphs, right? Uh, and, you know, edge-level labels, you can also predict something on the level of edges or even whether edges exist, which is known as link prediction. So this means you can say detect new side effect interactions between pairs of drugs in a drug-drug interaction graph. So you know which drugs interact with each other in a bad way. You can infer new side effects by looking at this graph. Or you can even predict things on the level of the whole graph. So predict cold chemical properties of a compound based on its atoms and bonds, right? So the whole graph, you predict one label for the whole graph. And, you know, whenever you're using neural networks, this is as you do before with other models. You use an appropriate loss function, like cross entropy, mean squared error, depending on what you're doing, and optimize by gradient descent and backdrop. And all of these existing libraries, PyG, DGL, PFGNN, Giraffe, they support this kind of functionality out of the box. So you don't have to worry about re-implementing backdrop for graph dense. It's already been done for you. Okay, and another very important categorization of tasks is transductive versus inductive. This was particularly important in earlier work on graph nets. So the transductive setting is quite popular industrially, actually, where your training algorithm is allowed to see everything, including test nodes. So imagine it as you have some labels on training nodes and you need to propagate them to all the other nodes in the graph. Very common in social networks, right? You might have labeled by hand some nodes in a social network, and then you want to predict how all the other nodes in a social network will respond to this label. And this is sometimes also called semi-supervised learning on graphs because kind of you're really treating all your nodes, including your test nodes, as like extra part of the input, really. And because you assume the graph structure is given to you and fixed up front, this means you can use several techniques that very strongly analyze from a graph theoretic point of view this structure, right? However, in general, we might be interested in solving inductive problems where you have test graphs that remain unseen during training. And that means you cannot foreshadow during training what the graph structure will look like. And as a result, it's way harder. Like you cannot use some of the great tools that graph theory offers you to study these kinds of problems. Okay, 
So this was a quick overview of the different uh, kinds of graphs we might deal with, how to mathematically talk about them, and different tasks on a graph. Now we can actually start to get into the meat of things, and uh, you might find it surprising that there's no graph in the title here. It's actually some interesting group theoretic terms, permutation and variance and equivariance. Why the hell are you talking to us about this? Well, basically, um, it's because these two concepts, if you understand them, are fundamental to understanding everything you'll ever need to know about basic graph neural networks. Okay, so that's why in the subtitle you can see these two terms are basically fundamentals of learning on graphs and sets. And if there's one thing you take away from this tutorial, I hope it's those two concepts. So here it's particularly important that if something doesn't feel right, you raise your hand immediately and you ask me about it. Okay, so we've seen why it's a good idea to study data that lives on graphs. And now we will see how to actually learn a useful function over graphs. That's our target for today. And before we dive into this, let's try to pause and ponder what is it that makes a function useful? This picture, which I drew, should be familiar to some of you. This is a convolution, which is the backbone of a convolutional neural network. And it's arguably what makes a function useful over images, right? And you can think about it, like, how does it work? You have this small matrix of parameters and you slide that matrix across your input, taking pointwise products and summing them up to compute responses in an output image, right? This is the essence behind convolutional neural networks. And it's really useful. So think about it. What is it that makes this function useful? Well, for example, the fact that you have one matrix and you're sliding it across in a weight shared manner means that you are detecting the same pattern no matter where it is in the image. Like the location doesn't matter, right? It's just the pattern that matters, right? Then the fact that uh, it's looking at pixels and its immediate neighborhood means it's nice and local. Right, So basically, the, we assume that the effects of neighboring pixels are far greater than the effects of pixels on opposite corners uh, of the image, right? So these, all, these are all kind of things that make the convolution very useful. We will formalize all of this, but I just want you to kind of intuitively get a feel for what we're trying to do here. And another property, which is very nice, that you might not uh, immediately foresee unless you work on segmentation tasks, is that convolution has this really cool mathematical property that if I change my input image by shifting it somewhat, the output of the convolution will shift exactly like that. And that's a very convenient property. For example, you're doing image segmentation because in image segmentation, you need to classify every pixel for what object it is. If I shift all of my objects by some amount, I should expect that mask to also shift by the same amount, right? And a convolution doesn't just approximately give you this, it guarantees it mathematically. Like you don't ever have to worry about this property. It's encoded by the convolution operation, okay? So let's try to recap all these things that I kind of told you without looking at my slide. Convolutions have very nice properties. Let's see if I recalled all of them. So the output changes predictably when the input is shifted. Yes. Errors in one input pixel don't propagate the entire output. This is connected with locality, right? Because the layer only acts on a locality of a pixel. If you have errors anywhere, those errors won't immediately propagate everywhere in the output, just around the neighborhood of that one pixel, which is good for stability, right? And finally, you have shared computation, which is distributed across neighborhoods, right? Which lets you detect patterns no matter where they are in the image. And now we will see how to take these concepts and formalize them over inputs that are structured like graphs. So where do we begin? I will start by potentially disappointing some of you. We're not going to start with graphs. We are going to start with sets. So graphs with no edges between them. Now you might be asking, Petar, why are you starting with sets? Like, isn't this a tutorial on graphs? Well, there are three good reasons why we should do that. The first reason is obviously because it's just sets. So it's just nodes, there's no edges. You have to carry one object less around when you're doing the math. And therefore it's gonna be much simpler to analyze sets than graphs. Secondly, whatever we conclude mathematically on sets, it turns out it will transfer super easily to graphs. So it's still not wasted work. Like everything we do for sets will be very useful when we move to graphs. And lastly, even if you restrict yourself to just learning on sets, it's still a super relevant thing to do, right? Uh, for anyone who works in computer vision, you've probably come across these kinds of point cloud tasks before where you have basically to tell me something about an object just by looking at its different points. Or if you looked at anything involving self-driving vehicles, how do they make sense of the world around them through these LIDAR sensors that basically bounce off different objects and therefore a self-driving car 
as this demonstration from Waymo shows, actually sees a collection of points that bounce off objects around them. And based on that collection of points, the self-driving vehicle must conclude what are the objects around me? How fast are they moving? Do I need to brake or something like this, right? So even if you restrict yourself just to learning over sets, you're still solving a very meaningful problem, okay? So I'm not telling you a toy problem. This can have a lot of interesting implications. So hopefully I've convinced you that it's okay for me to start with sets. So let's start with sets. As I said, we're going to assume that our graph has no edges, so we only have a set of nodes B. And typically, since we're doing deep learning, we will want to featureize this set. So there's going to be some feature vector Xi for every single node I. I'm going to assume that this feature vector is just a k-dimensional real vector, as you normally would assume that in deep learning. Okay. And what's the typical way in which we give this data to the machine learning model? we typically stack those features together into what we call a node feature matrix. So this capital X is a matrix that has the node uh, rows equal to the number of nodes. And the i row of this matrix will tell you the features of the i node. node. Okay? This is the standard way in which you feed node feature data for both set and graph neural networks. Okay? Now, this is very important. The very act of you doing this like stacking the node features in a matrix is very, very bad, okay? Why is it bad? Because you've specified an ordering of the nodes by doing this. Like I've identified this is node one, this is node two, this is node N. And I've told you at the beginning, the set is unordered. There should be no ordering in this set whatsoever. I'm not assuming any ordering between my nodes, okay? So this is very important. We've done something very bad. So whenever we apply a neural network over this data, we need to make sure it doesn't perpetuate that badness, right? We want the output of any neural network over this input to not depend on the exact way you chose to stack the features, okay? So what do we want pictorially? Imagine I have a set with five nodes and each node has some node feature vector. Since we're doing deep learning, we're interested in learning a function, a neural network that takes those features and gives you a label, right, for that entire set. So what do I actually want now? If I were to change the way you see those five objects, perhaps by shuffling them around or whatever, and I apply my same neural network to those inputs, I should expect exactly the same output, right? This is generally the, what it means for a function over sets to be uh, favorable, whatever that means. Okay, so let's try to formalize it mathematically. What did we do by changing the order of the nodes? Well, let's think about operations that change the order of the nodes. For those of you who know combinatorics, this should be quite familiar. This is the permutation, right? For a set of n elements, there should be n factorial many permutations that change the way you see these rows. So here's one particular example of a permutation of five objects where object A goes to the third position, B to the second, and so on. So this operation shuffles around the pack, but it doesn't change the underlying set of objects. It's still the same set of objects. So we don't want our neural network to be affected by operations like this, okay? And one thing that's quite convenient for us, and it's related to some very interesting concepts in group theory, is that actually you can talk about permutations without ever leaving the realm of linear algebra, which is very convenient because deep learning typically lives in linear algebra. So if you can stay within that domain, that's really nice. And it turns out every permutation defines a unique node times node matrix, which we often call a permutation matrix. And here you have one specific example of a permutation matrix for the permutation 2413. And you can see they have a very specific shape, right? They have zeros almost everywhere. They have exactly one one in every row and every column, which encodes the order of the permutation. And you know, you can revise your linear algebra 101 and verify for me that when you left multiply that matrix with a node feature matrix that I prepared before, the only effect that it does is it changes the order of the nodes, nothing else. So it's perfect for what we want to talk about, right? And uh, that's basically what we're going to use to derive exactly mathematically what does it mean for a neural network over sets to be useful, okay? And this brings us to our first important concept of the day, permutation invariance. So we want, as we said, functions, neural networks, f of x, that work over these node feature matrices and don't depend on the order of the rows. So what does this mean mathematically? If I apply a permutation matrix to the input, that shouldn't change the output, 
And there we go. That's our first important equation of the day. We arrive at permutation invariance, and we say that f of x is a permutation invariant function. If no matter what permutation matrix P I choose, applying the function on Px is the same as applying it on x. So applying it to the input does not change the output. Okay. Does this make sense? Are there any questions at this point? Okay, good. So this is going to be very important because if you don't understand these concepts, you will get lost when we start to introduce more things. Uh, yes? So if the set was actually sequential, then the permutation would matter and then you would need something that actually is permutation sensitive. But now we're assuming the set is an order. There's no geometry attached to it. Okay, so in this particular setting, you need this property. Yeah. Okay, so now you might be saying, hang on, Petar, like you've told me what is the property that these set functions should have. But, you know, I'm a deep learning practitioner. How do I actually implement something that satisfies this? So uh, worry no more. I'm going to show you an actual model equation that satisfies this constraint. And that is the popular deep set model. Well, in reality, people have studied models like the deep sets for decades, but uh, we call it deep sets in honor of the work of Mandel, Zakir, and others who have proved theoretically a lot of really cool properties about these models. So the model generally works like this. Your function first, you have this first learnable component, this MLP psi, which is applied to every node feature vector separately. So you process every node in isolation using this shared function. Then you sum up all of the node features together that you get as a result of applying Psi. And from the summed up vector, you take this another neural network Phi to predict the outputs that you care about, okay? And what is the part of this equation that makes it permutation invariant? Well, you guessed it, it's the summing over here, right? That's the critical part because the outcome of a sum is not dependent on what's the order I choose to give you the rows, right? And what it also tells us is you don't have to use sum, right? This was the originally proposed model, but you can use anything which is what we call permutation invariant aggregator. So something that will combine all the rows of this matrix in a way that doesn't depend how you do it. And that means you could have used max, you could have used average, all of those functions have that same property. And for that reason, because I don't want you to be thinking about sums, I want you to be thinking about, you know, a general aggregation function that could do this. I'm going to, from now on, always replace this guy with this O plus. So whenever you see an O plus, that means it's something that will aggregate stuff without caring for the order, okay? So it could be a sum, it could be a max, it could be an average, whatever, right? Obviously, there's a lot of interesting wiggle room on what's the best one to use. And we will discuss towards the end of this tutorial which one is the best to use in which situations. So that should be a fun discussion. But for now, think of this O plus as anything which could work. Okay, now the second important concept that I told you we will need is permutation equivariance. And why do we need it? Well, in the previous steps, we predicted one label for the entire set and by summing all the set elements together, right? And that's great if your label is on the level of the entire set, but what if you need to predict something in the nodes? So you need, a, you need to do segmentation or something like this, right? So every node now is associated with a label. Well, in this case, the summing is actually a pretty bad operation because it destroys everything about the individual nodes, right? You might be able to recover it depending on the setting, but it still puts a lot of pressure, right? So we actually don't want something that will give us, in this case, we actually don't want something that will give us a single vector. We want something that will give us an output for every single node. And what does this mean? Well, when I permute the input, I should now actually expect a different answer, but I should expect an answer that's different in a very predictable way, just like in convolutions. When I shift the input, the output shifts the same way. Here, if I permute the input, the output is permuted in the same way. And this property, permutation equivariance, allows me to still identify which row corresponds to which node even after I've done my operations, okay? So that's the key idea. We say that a function f of x, and here I call it capital F of x to kind of make it clear to you that it's returning still a node feature matrix rather than a vector, okay? That's the only reason why it's capital. So this f of x takes the node feature matrix, returns a different node feature matrix with updated features. And we say it's permutation equivariant if no matter what permutation matrix I choose, 
it doesn't matter if I multiply it before or after applying my function, okay? So this is the very important property which will allow us to predict things on the level of nodes rather than the level of full sets, okay? So does that make sense? That's our second important concept of the day. Okay, so we can keep going. Now, invariance and equivariance are the two fundamental principles. There is one more fundamental principle. If you remember what I told you about CNNs, that it was really important that if I have an error somewhere in my image, it doesn't propagate to all the pixels immediately, but stays contained in some local part, right? So actually, there's a third important constraint, and that is locality. To illustrate why it's important, so convolution neural networks, as we discussed, are built to be resistant to shifts. So I have this nice picture of a house. If I apply a shift to that picture, great. The component guarantees they will be processed in the same way, okay? But real world is often not so nice. Like real world will not just give us a pure shift to the data. It will do a pure shift and corrupt the data a little bit, right? We might get this like distorted house with various errors here and there, right? And what we want, you know, a ComNet is not designed to deal with these kinds of distortions, right? But what we still would like is if such a distortion happens, the errors shouldn't propagate and explode everywhere, right? They should be contained. Our model should be geometrically stable, okay? So how do we enforce that? Well, I won't uh, have time to go through the whole math, but I will just say that the finding we make uh, in our book and otherwise is that the way to keep the signal stable is locality. So you actually just build a function that's somehow local around the particular node. Uh, and then you model large scale interactions by making the model very deep, okay? And that's the reason why usually when you see convnets, you see them using a fairly small convolutional kernel like three by three. So that's a very small neighborhood around one pixel, but then you make them super deep to propagate all the way to whatever output you want, okay? And therefore, we would like to support some notion of locality in our layers. Another great analogy is Fourier transforms versus wavelets. For those of you coming from signal processing, you will know that Fourier transforms and wavelets are two different ways to express any function, including invariant and equivariant functions, but they do it in very different ways. Fourier transforms are these combinations of sines and cosines that are represented on the whole input domain, whereas wavelets are zero almost everywhere except for a tiny portion of the input. So what happens when you have an error somewhere? With a Fourier transform, that error immediately propagates everywhere, right? And that's really bad. That means you're very unstable numerically. With wavelets, most of the output space is zero, so that's totally fine, okay? So similar ideas. We want locality. How do we make locality happen for sets though? That's an interesting question, right? There's one very easy way to do locality in sets, which is just treat every node by itself and don't model them together at any point whatsoever. So this aligns really well with the first step of the deep sets model that I told you about, which is take a feature vector for each node, transform it with a shared function Psi, and this gives you updated features for that node, okay? To get an output matrix, you can stack all these HIs into a matrix H. But from now on, I'm actually not going to use this matrix view so much because we're gonna be, when we talk about equivariant functions, we're gonna be a lot more interested in what it does to a single node rather than what it does on the whole matrix level because usually you get the whole matrix by distributing the computations for individual nodes, okay? And uh, you might be asking, you know, like, what else can we do? Well, actually, when it comes to sets, this is typically as far as we can get, right? Because I started off by assuming the set is unordered. There are no edges. The moment you have a layer that looks at several nodes at once, you are no longer honoring that assumption. Like you're assuming a graph without even knowing it, okay? This is very important. So without assuming that you live on some kind of a graph, you cannot... You cannot have an equivariant function that looks at more than one node. You fundamentally assume them to be different samples that cannot be related, okay? Now, obviously this is a very harsh assumption and we will deal with it quite a bit when we talk about graphs. But uh, for now, just believe me that when we're working on sets, we fundamentally throw out all structure and therefore only possible local equivariant layer is this one, okay? Yes? I didn't find the slide. Uh, this one? Yeah, so basically we build convolution neural networks to be resistant to image shifts. So I have this picture of a house, I shift it, the ComNet will process that nicely. 
but in the real world, nature will not quite just do a shift, but also do some weird kind of distortions, right? Like you'll get some noise everywhere, basically. And convolution networks are not designed to denoise this. Like they're not going to guarantee you mathematically that this will be properly processed. However, what you definitely don't want is when there's a tiny error here, you don't want that error to immediately propagate everywhere in the output and completely like numerically mess up your result. That's the main idea, right? And the kind of prescription we make for that is that you should have local layers that look at only tiny neighborhoods around some, <clears throat> some vertex so that those errors do not propagate. Does that uh, make sense? Yeah, okay, yeah. Yes, it would, but it's a much more geometrically controlled propagation if the layer is local, right? So the model can actually have more space to apply good denoising. I mean, I'm telling you this from a very intuitive standpoint. In our book, we actually have a proof of this, but yeah, that's generally the idea. Mm -hmm. You could, but it would be functionally equivalent to uh, doing something like this, actually. So we will talk about this in a second, but yes, you could. But it boils down to more or less the same picture, okay? Because this whole global feature has a lot of pressure under it. So putting it back into the nodes is just like, you know, put the summary back where it belongs, basically. But this, uh, this general idea lets us talk about deep sets as an instance of a wider blueprint. You have equivariant parts, which don't destroy the structure of your input, okay? And as mentioned, yes, I could also include the set of all nodes in here, and that would also work. Like that still wouldn't break the locality assumption. Potentially, if I need a prediction over the whole set, then I do an invariant tail. Oh, actually, sorry. There's one reason why you won't be able to do that, because you start from a node, you go to the global features, and then it goes back to the nodes, which means that implicitly there's a path connecting the two nodes. And this means you're no longer assuming a set. It's a bit implicit, but actually it's a graph at this point. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can talk about it after, after the session also. But yeah, so this gives us a general idea. Start with equivariant layers, stack them, stack them, stack them with some nonlinearities in between to model individual domain elements. And then when you want a prediction over the whole set, if you need it, reduce it using some O plus and then predict the output, okay? Now, of course, you might be asking yourself, is this really as far as we can get with sets? So what we showed so far is if we want the function on a set to be useful, it must be permutation equivariant or invariant. And deep sets offer you one way of achieving this permutation invariance. So you might be asking yourselves, is this necessarily the only way to do this, right? And it turns out for many classes of input sets, the answer can be proven to be a decisive yes. And that is, you can come to me with a brand new function that is permutation invariant and say, hey, I have this brand new model, which is great, and it does great on sets, and it's, it satisfies permutation invariance. If it satisfies permutation invariance, it is mathematically guaranteed that I can re-express its equations to fit this deep sets model that I showed you before, okay? I unfortunately don't have the time to cover the proofs of this fact, but if you want to see them, you should check out the original deep sets paper from Zahir and others. And also this uh, great follow-up paper from Wagstaff, Fuchs, and Ingelka and others that deals with uh, the situation where these, um, <clears throat> where the sets also have real value features on them, okay? And also just to be clear, at the beginning, I gave you a computer vision motivation for why we should look at uh, set structured inputs. And uh, you might already, if you're in computer vision, you should already know about one very popular application of deep sets in computer vision, and that is the point man model. So the point net model, which deals with point clouds, was proposed concurrently, published at CVPR, more or less concurrently with the deep sets model. And it empirically shows that this kind of pipeline where you process every node in isolation and then aggregate them together at the end, only they use max pooling rather than some pooling, works really well on point cloud tasks like uh, predicting the properties of inputs, even from partial inputs or classifying or segmenting different parts and so on. Okay, so, now uh, we also need, well, at this point, I've hopefully convinced you that uh, we can take learning on sets and uh, mathematically talk about all the possible functions that are useful when learning over sets. 
uh, now we are ready to make the jump to graphs. And uh, I'm going to just very quickly tell you how to make the connection to graphs, and then we will make our first break. Okay? So, uh, as mentioned, when we make the jump from sets to graphs, we still have a set of nodes, but now we also add a set of edges between them, right? So there is this collection of edges, which uh, uh, now rings up pairs of nodes. And as we discussed, there are many ways to represent this in a computer, but the one we will use, which is most convenient mathematically, and also because we're talking about deep learning from the lens of linear algebra, is gonna be most convenient for us to talk about adjacency matrices to represent these graphs. So it's a matrix A of shape nodes times nodes, such that uh, you have uh, zeros where there's no edge and ones where there is an edge. And this now makes edges the part of the domain. And as I said before, there are many other things you can do to these edges. There can be the real valued features. There can be even full on edge features on the edges. That's all possible. But for now, we're sticking with this binary view of edge versus no edge, just because the maths is a little bit simpler. But uh, the, all the conclusions we make on the binary case will transfer uh, analogously to the case where edges have features on them. Okay. And what's changed really? Our main desiderata of what's a useful function over graphs without assuming any additional geometry is still the same. Permutation invariance and permutation equivariance. So what's changed? If you remember, this was my initial condition for a useful function over sets. What's different? It's exactly the same picture. I've just added some edges between my nodes and I have to be careful now, whenever I shuffle my nodes, I need to shuffle the edges in exactly the same way. But the condition is exactly the same. This is why I was telling you that starting with sets should transfer reasonably easily to graphs. And it's much more a much more tame introduction to the topic, right? So the only difference to the conditions we had before is that now edges are also part of the domain. And therefore, whenever I permute my input node features, I must also accordingly permute my edges. Otherwise it's not the same graph, right? But if you represent the graph with an adjacency structure of a matrix that's rows and columns equal to the number of nodes, well, that just means I need to permute the rows and permute the columns appropriately. And once again, you can do linear algebra 101 and convince yourself that this amounts to just PAP transposed for any permutation matrix P. Okay. And now we can just rewrite the definitions we had before for permutation invariance and equivariance over sets by adding an additional adjacency matrix input and permuting it appropriately, we get the equivalent expressions for graphs, right? So a function over graphs is permutation invariant. If no matter what permutation matrix I choose, permuting the nodes and edges doesn't change the output. And it's equivariant if no matter what permutation matrix I choose, it doesn't matter if I permute the inputs or the outputs, I'll get exactly the same result. And here I'm implicitly assuming, by the way, that the layer does not change the adjacency structure. So it just returns different node features. So I'm only permuting the output and I'm not talking about edges, they're still the same, okay? Now, the one thing which is different from graphs compared to sets is this third item, the locality, right? Because when we talked about sets, the only way we could do locality is by processing each node in isolation. Everything else would have been assuming there's connections between the nodes. But on graphs, we now have a broader context, right? Because nodes are connected. We can talk about a node's neighborhood, like some locality around a particular node. There's many ways to define a neighborhood, but in graphs, you usually define this one half neighborhood and the I for node I, which is just the collection of all the nodes J that are linked to I with an edge, right? Simple enough. And once I have this concept, I can extract the multi-set of all neighborhood features, X and I, which is just collect all the XJs for those nodes J that are adjacent to me. There's a reason why I'm calling it the multi-set, note the double angle bracket, is because I could have multiple neighbors with the same features and the set would destroy that multiplicity, right? But here I actually want to be mindful of some nodes being repeated in this, uh, this multi-set. And now I can expand my local function to not just look at one node, but also look at all the features in its neighborhood. This allows me to define a local layer, right? And now once you have a layer like this, you can build a graph neural network just by applying your local layer to every single node in isolation, stacking the results together in a matrix. And this gives you an equivariant function over graphs, right? So, well, there's actually one condition that we need, right? Because this local function phi now works over this multi-set of neighborhoods inputs. 
So it must be permutation invariant to that order of the neighbors, right? Because if it wouldn't be, then it would depend on how you stack the neighbors, right? So as long as phi is permutation invariant, F will be permutation equivariant. And I think it's a really fun algebraic exercise to try to prove this. So this can be, if you have some time after the tutorial or in between the session, try to just prove it to yourself that if this guy is invariant, this guy will be equivariant, okay? And really everything that I've been telling you so far, everything I've been telling you so far was leading up to this, okay? So this is a pictorial representation of everything we've covered so far. So how does the graph neural network work? You take features of one node, you take the multi-set of all the features in its neighborhood, and based on all those features, the local layer updates the vectors to some latent space. And that's it, you apply this in parallel to every single neighborhood. Everything we've told you about in maths and permutation variance and equivariance was leading up to this. And sometimes when I give a talk on graph neural networks to a more uninitiated audience, I would start by giving this picture and not even talk about the maths, right? But if you want to truly learn how to utilize these models and deploy them somewhere, it's much better to understand the principles that led to this equations and to this picture. So I hope you agree with me that all this extra work that we did over sets and so on was worth it because now you understand fundamentally the mathematical principles behind the layer like this. And lastly, I just want to note a little bit about once you have a function like this, what can you do with it? So imagine I give you a graph structured input. So some node feature matrix and some adjacency matrix features XI in node I. I run my graph neural network over them, which is just a stack of these equivariant layers and nonlinearities, which as we discussed, will update the features of each node to some latent space and in a way that's mindful of the immediate neighbors, right? Uh, usually it won't change the adjacency matrix. We'll talk about those operations as well later in this tutorial. And now once I have these latents, what can I do? Well, I can do node classification by just classifying each HI vector separately with some classifier. That's a fully equivariant function. I can classify entire graphs, but I must be mindful that the function doesn't depend on the order of the nodes. So I need to, as we discussed with deep sets, I need to reduce all of my node features with some O plus before classifying it. And finally, quite uniquely to graphs, you also have edges. So you can classify things on edges or even predict the existence of edges, which is known as link prediction. And to do that, you can build a classifier over the features of the two nodes that are incident to that edge, and maybe also some edge features if you have access to them, right? So using this blueprint, you can build a graph neural network for any task you care about. And that model I told you about with discovering a new antibiotic was a pretty straightforward application of this blueprint for one type of local function on the task of antibiotic prediction. However, you know, we built these permutation equivariant functions by applying this local permutation invariant function, right? But I haven't yet told you what it is, right? So I haven't yet given you an implementation you can play with. And depending on which research literature you read, F can be referred to as a GNN layer and this local function as either diffusion, propagation, or message passing, because these things were rediscovered from so many different principles like probabilistic graphical models, graph signal processing, and so on, computer vision. Each one of those areas had a different name for this general same concept. And, you know, I've still left you with the question of how do we implement phi? And it's a super intense area of research. As you might imagine, every day there's like dozens of papers coming out just on this very topic, how to implement that local function. And therefore, I cannot hope to even understand myself everything that's going on, let alone tell you about all, all of it. But one thing that's very convenient for us is that uh, we should be able to have a blueprint to navigate this very dynamic space. However, We'll be talking about this and about the different graph neural networks in the second part of the tutorial. Uh, we can now take a uh, five-minute break. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please take that.